it's talking about the names of God. That God revealed himself to, what is that, a hum? Here, did you mute everything else? Mm -hmm. Okay. God revealed himself in the Old Testament by his names. And the very first name that we see is going to be Jehovah, which is I am that I am. That's what he revealed himself to Israel with. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So, but we're going to start up here in a little bit in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14. So I hope you have your Bibles this morning. Listen, our church is a church that believes in the word of God. Our church is a church that we need to be having our Bibles with us. Amen. Y'all believe that? Amen. Amen. God's word is true. Doesn't matter what man has said, what man has designed, what man has come up. Man's doctrines, I don't care about. I care about the doctrines of the Lord Jesus Christ. I care about the gospel of Jesus. You know what the gospel is? You know what it is? Setting captives free. That's what we're about here. We're about setting captives free. Number one, you need to get set free yourself and embrace what God has for you. We've been talking about it for two years now, maybe longer than that now, this wall here. This is your identity in Christ Jesus. So many of us believe so many lies and so many things because of things we've been through in our early life, even into our later life. And we listen to those lies, but I'm going to tell you right now, when God looks down on you, this is what he sees, and this is what he says about you. Amen? Are y'all getting that right there? Man, I tell you, you come to church and just focus on this. I had, uh, one of the guys told me a while back, he said, man, I come to church, and while we're worshiping, I just look up there, and I just thank God for all those things that he says I am, because his word is true. Amen? Father, we praise you. I thank you, Father, for your son Jesus. I thank you that you sent your son so that he could destroy the works of the enemy, that he could manifest you to us, to show us the Father, to show us you, Father God. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Father God, that it is eternal, that your word is the word that it even holds everything together, Father, according to Colossians. We give you the praise. We give you the glory. We ask that you help us to just open up our hearts, open up our minds to your word, to receive what you have in the word for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to just back up and go over those names and read them to you again, and then we're going to move on from there. The first one was Yehovah Sitkanu. It's the Lord, my righteousness. Yehovah Sitkanu, the Lord, my righteousness. Yehovah Makadesh, the Lord who sanctifies. We are set apart, and it is our reasonable service to just serve him. That's your reasonable service, just to love the Lord, is it not? Number three, Jehovah Shama. Jehovah is there. And I would say Jehovah is there. He's here. He's with you everywhere you go. And if you know that, man, then nothing can pull you down. If you just realize that God is there for you. Number four, Jehovah Shalom. That is Jehovah is peace. Peace is nothing lacking, nothing missing. And then Jehovah Rapha. The Lord who heals you. Many of us have had even sicknesses, diseases, and things like that. Yes, when Jesus Christ went to the cross, uh, it says in 1 Peter 2, 24, it says, by his stripes you he were healed. That is a spiritual healing first, I believe, but it is also physical healing because spirit, soul, and body is what falls suit when we get healed and raised from the dead in that spiritual aspect. Many of us have had diseases. How many of you had a disease in the past and the Lord has healed you from it? Or maybe even a syndrome, something that was maybe not necessarily a disease, but causing issues in your problem in your body, but it was a syndrome that something you were listening to. How many of you have struggled with things in the past, but God has healed you? One, two, three, four, four. I'm going to tell you right now, five, six, seven. Everybody in here ought to be raising their hands. When I was a child, I had what was called spinal meningitis. Anybody ever heard of spinal meningitis? I remember as a child when they put me on the stainless steel table as a little boy, probably five or six years old, and they had stripped me down and they were going to stick this needle in me. Now, to me, as a child, that needle was this big. <laughs> you know, it was exaggerated. And, and, and I was scared and I was in fear, but they did what was called a spinal tap in me. 
And they confirmed it. They did many tests and they confirmed he has spinal meningitis. Immediately they quarantined me, kind of like what we saw over this COVID-19 mess over the last few years. Yeah, there was something there, but they, they took it to an extreme. We know that. But they quarantined me, put me in a room, had these doors. Whenever somebody would come in, whether it was a doctor or a nurse, my mom and my dad, they wouldn't allow any other family members in there. None of my brothers could come in, but mom and dad could come in. They had to gear up with the whole stuff, and they would come in in order for to protect them. I don't remember how long I was in the hospital for, but it seemed like an eternity for me as a little child. And I remember one day my mom and dad told him, test him again, test him again. They're like, no, we've already done the test. They said, no test, run some tests again. And they ran some tests again and they did some stuff. They came back and said, it's not there anymore. The Lord healed me. That was one of my early experiences with Father God. As a child, I didn't even really comprehend that. But as I've gotten older, I've looked back and I looked at that, and I, and I thank God that he healed me as a little child. There were churches all over praying for me. I remember mom and dad telling me there are people all over the world praying for you. Because my dad, he was a uh, at a seminary school. He trained lots of people in the ministry and sent out evangelists, missionaries into the, in the mission field. And, and I knew that people were praying for me, but I didn't understand the magnitude of that. It's incredible when people pray. Yes, sir. So if it's not physical, if you're one of those children, you have to experience it. So, and that alone, that is the very, very first healing. That's right. You're so right. What that first healing does is it restores us back to be able to even go to Father God through Jesus Christ. That's right. So, that's a spiritual healing. That's what Paul talks about. I wish that you may prosper and be in health, even as our soul prospers. And he talks about spirit, soul, and body. The first step is spirit. It's getting restored. It's getting that relationship back in place. Amen? Amen. So the next one is Jehovah Jireh. That's God provides. How many of you know that God provides for you? That he's made a provision for you? That means that he provides Jehovah Nisi. It is the Lord, my banner. And that banner is that banner. I talked about it last Sunday. Like when we, when our country has gone into battles, has, has gone into wars in the past, what is the banner that goes before our guys? It's the flag. It's a banner that goes before us. God goes before you, no matter what you're getting ready to experience. Realize that God is there. He is, the, he is the commander in chief. He's the one that has set up everything and the armies are going before you. If you will realize that, no matter what you're going through, then God, will, that peace will just flood your heart. It doesn't matter what you go through. We've all been through some stuff, have we not? Number seven, uh, or number seven was Jehovah Nisi. And then the last one is Jehovah Rocha. The Lord is my shepherd. And one of my most favorite Chapters in the Bible is Psalm 23. I'd say it's a lot of ours. And with him being a shepherd for us, he leads us beside those still waters. And he makes us to lie down. We have to be made to lie down a lot of times, don't we? We have to be made to rest. And a lot of times God will bring things across our path in order that we will take that rest. I've been there. I've done that. I've had to just rest. And we are to rest in here in him. So God called out Abraham. What land was he in? The land of, what is it? Ur Chaldees, that's right. He called him out. Listen, God has called us out of the world, but yet I'm going to tell you right now, we are to remain in the world. A lot of people, they get so spiritually minded, they're not any earthly worth at all. He called us out. What he's called us out of is a system of sin that's been set up. He's called us out of that. He's called us into righteous living. But God called out Abraham from the world to accept him as a father and to start seeing him and hearing him. And I want to propose to you this morning, that that's what God's done to each and every one of us. God, Father God, wants to be a father to you and me. Many of us have had fathers growing up. You know, we've all had fathers unless he was totally checked out, just not there. Some of us may have been just raised by mama. But God wants to be a father to us and show us his love for us. 
And in that, we experience God. Amen? The name Jehovah is linked to the covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the Old Covenant or Old Testament, as we call it. These names also correspond to the fivefold promise God makes to his people in the New Covenant. These names reveal God's character, but also point to their fulfillment in the person and the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to mention to him, we mentioned, I mentioned, my, I don't know if it was last Sunday or Sunday before last, but I want to mention to, him, to you again, if you don't have them already written down, you can write them down. There's five of them. And these are the five things that the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ testifies to. Amen? The blood testifies to number one, sin, forgiveness of sin, and deliverance from sin. If you're not experiencing sin, then you've not appropriated the blood of the Lord. Or if you're not experiencing freedom from sin and freedom from being delivered from those things, then you're just simply not trusting in the Lord. You're not appropriating what Christ has done on the cross for you. Christ has done it. Is there anything else that Jesus needs to do no. in order to restore us back to Father? No. no. All we are to do is believe. Amen. Believe, you know, remember the old song, trust and obey, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. How many of y'all remember that? Man, there's some good doctrine in that song. Because if we would just trust and obey, everything else would just work itself out. That's the way it works with the Lord. He goes before us, Amen. So number one, the blood testifies of sin, the forgiveness of sin and deliverance from sin. Number two, the blood testifies of the Spirit, and that is the fullness of the Holy Spirit, the fullness of the Holy Spirit within us to be able to hear God's voice now when he speaks to us, he speaks to us spirit to spirit, amen? They've actually discovered in science that the spiritual realm actually communicates in one of the uh, brain waves. Is it, is it alpha? Yeah. Theta. It's through the theta brain waves. Isn't that incredible? That through theta brain waves, that's how God speaks to our spirit. He speaks to our inner man. And then when our inner man receives it, it goes up and we receive it up here in the brain. That's incredible. That just confirms the word of God, that God speaks to us, number one. A lot of times we may think that God just just speaks and we just kind of, it's like we walk into a bubble or something. It's like, oh, God, that's you. Boop. Give me another one. Boop. You know, no, that's not it. He is inside of you. The word of God says in Ephesians 3.20, now unto him, now unto who? Now unto him that is able, that's God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you ask or think according to the power that resides in pastor, no. The, uh, according to the power that, that resides in pastors, why? No. <laughs> according to the power that resides in Job? No. Come on. Now, the power resides in Joe and in, in, in Sandy and in pastor, but it says according to the power that's where? In me. So who's got the power of the Lord on the inside? Oh, yes. Listen, you can't boast about that, though, because it's, it's God in you. It is his glory in you. Just, man, it baffles my mind to think that, that, that God, you know, in, in the past, he chose to be in a box in the, in the Ark of the Covenant. His presence was there. And, and you know, and we know that he's, that, that's ended. But now he says that I am choosing to reside on the inside of you. That's what's going on in the inside of you. The Holy Ghost has taken up residence inside of you. And the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, spirit to spirit. How many of you have an inner man? Even you ladies, you don't know you have an inner man? That's what the Lord calls it. But the inner man is what bears witness with the Spirit of God. Amen? So the fullness of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And that fullness is that now I can hear him, and that's grace. How many of you love grace? I love grace, glory to God. Because grace is God dealing with my heart and giving me time to deal with what he is telling me and allowing that grace to minister to me and seeing it reflecting in my heart. Grace ought to be reflected to everybody out there in your life, folks. 
Sometimes it's hard, though, I understand. And the only times it's hard is when we listen to the enemy. The enemy tells us to get an attitude. The enemy tells us to do this. The enemy tells us that. And the Holy Spirit is saying, let love show. Let love come through. Let my grace work through you. Let my mercy work through you. Now, that doesn't tell us that we're to let people walk all over us. We'll be talking about that in the boundaries class. I believe it's going to be a really eye-opener for y'all. And an eye-opener for us. Yep, praise God. Number three, the blood testifies of soundness. And that soundness is health and healing. God's given you a sound mind. That's what his word says. So when we hear fears, we hear things that just get us out of control. We're worried about tomorrow. We're just, we're worried about the what ifs. Well, what if this happens? What if that happens? What if so-and-so does this? What if so-and-so does that? Or I should have done this and I should have done that. How many of you have heard, have heard the words come out of your mouth? Well, if I had just done such and such. <clears throat> come on, every one of us have. You know, the shoulda, woulda, couldas, they'll keep you glued to the past. Listen, the past is the past. It's done. You can't do anything to change that. But what you can do now is affect your, your present standing, your present moving forward into the future and trusting God. So a lot of us may even have pasts that are just, man, they're ugly. But that's the past. Can't do anything about it other than just trust the Lord in the future now. Amen? To stay in the past is to allow yourself to be glued to hell. That's what I believe. Okay? Number four, success. And I believe the success in the Lord Jesus Christ that the blood testifies of is the freedom from the curse of the law. Amen? It's freedom from the curse of the law. Because with that, the curse of the law, there were so many things brought in, so many penalties. If you don't do this, then this is what's going to happen. If you don't do that, then this is what's going to happen. I'm going to tell you right now that God's given us 1 John 1, 9. It says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the truth. Now, I might do some things that, uh, you know, what's, what's over man soweth, that shall he also reap. If I decided to go down and rob a place or something, I guarantee you, your pastor would probably not be here next Sunday, but I'd be in jail. I'll be going to prison. I ain't going to do that, holy. Thank you, Jesus. But there's certain things that there's a law also that's still in place that whatever you sow, that's what you're going to reap. If we sow unto the Spirit, we shall reap things of the Spirit, shall we not? But if you sow unto the flesh, you're going to reap things of the flesh. That's why he tells us, put that flesh down daily. Don't listen to the flesh. Let it go. Don't, don't go there, but run to me. Amen. Number five, security. The blood testifies of security in the Lord. And we've learned within Christ you're significant, accepted, and you're secure. So many of us feel so unsafe. So many of us feel in, like we're in that place of, I just, I don't feel protected. I'm going to tell you right now, God is watching over you. He is protecting you. And that is the freedom from fear of death and the freedom from hell because of being spiritually born again. Amen? And that's what Clyde was talking about. That's the first healing, is healing us spiritually, restoring us back to the Father. So in this verse, that verse in 2.13, let me read it again. It says, but now in Christ Jesus, in Ephesians 2.13, but now in Christ Jesus, not later, not somewhere off down the road, but he says, but now, that is present tense, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Jesus Christ, by the blood of our Christ. It is by the blood of Christ, nothing more, that has brought us nigh to God and all his blessings for us. In every one of those names of God that I just read you again, that's who God is, and that's who he wants to be for you. So the blood has brought you into a place that you can stand on that solid foundation, like Mitch was talking about, a sheer cliff, but up on top, man, nobody ain't getting that. Ain't nobody able to get to that other than you and the Lord says, I'm, I'm carrying you in the palm of my hand. Do you think if God is carrying you in the palm of his hand, do you think that's a sure foundation? Do you think the enemy can come in and, and, and take advantage of you? 
Listen, God says, trust me. Just trust me and I'm going to take care of you. Amen? You know, yes. Jesus says that sheep are in his hand. Yeah. And Jesus mm -hmm. I like that. that. That's good. Yeah. Sheep are in his hands and Jesus is in his hands. That's good. Praise God. Amen. Beautiful. So it is the blood of Christ, nothing more. So it's Christ's righteousness and don't add anything else to it. We've talked about that. It's Jesus and nothing else. When you've accepted Jesus and say, he is my Lord, glory to God. Number one, it doesn't make Jesus Lord. We've talked about that. Jesus is Lord, whether you realize it or not. One day, every knee will bow. It's up to us to say, okay, here I am. I submit to you. It has brought us nigh so we can now have a father and experience his Love. Amen. Let's move on to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14. It says, For he, who, who is he? Who is he? For he is our peace. The Lord Jesus Christ. He is your peace. He is your shalom. There's that name, Yehovah Shalom. He is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. The middle wall of partition was the veil of the temple separating the Holy of Holies from the inner court. And only the high priest could go into it once a year. It wasn't a thing, hey, I think I'm going to go down there in the Holy Holies. And, uh, no, you ain't doing that. That ain't happening. He could only go into it once a year. And that was on Yom Kippur. That was considered, that's what they call the Day of Atonement. This year was October 5th for 2022. That was the day of Yom Kippur. And that was to offer the blood of sacrifice and incense. And it's very interesting. The word of God it makes it clear. It says that when they would go in once a year, bring in the blood of the rams, bulls, what have you, that that blood was to be offered. What it was also doing, though, it was bringing up a reminder of all those past sins. I want you to know and I want you to understand that with God, the blood of Jesus Christ, it doesn't need to be offered anymore, does it, Mitch? Does Jesus Christ need to come down from heaven and do this thing over again and go to the cross and die? Has he done it? Yeah, the word of God says over in Revelation that God that he says, I saw a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. We could get into some really deep stuff right there that I believe, but we're, we're not going to go there. But the blood has been offered once and for all, and it doesn't have to be offered again. Why? Sufficient. It's sufficient. It's sufficient. There needs be no other sacrifice. And so our sins are not brought up like with Israel every year because it had to be offered once a year, that atonement for their sins. So God says in his word, he says, I will remember their sins no more. I love that. You know, we think of, we think of in our terms and stuff. A lot of times we have a tendency to westernize a lot of stuff in the Bible. I get that, you know. But we think that, well, God is just, he's just going to forget about it. No, God forgets nothing. If God were to forget, then that would be a character of man. We forget things, do we not? But God says, when he says, I will remember their sins no more, what he is saying is, you know what, honey? <laughs> I don't know if you call you honey or not. I call you honey. She's my honey. But it would be me saying, you know what? I'll never bring that up again. It's in the past. That's what God is telling us, is that I'm never going to bring this thing up again and throw it in your face. Anybody ever had somebody throw something in your face? Would you remember back in 1986 when you said blah, 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 November 20th? <laughs> Some people, yeah, they keep a list. I'm telling you, folks, get rid of the list. Forgive them and move on. And if anybody's holding something against you, forgive them and move on. Forgiveness is the key to stepping into more grace, folks. So that middle wall of partition, what he's saying there, is I've broken that thing down. It's gone. It's removed. So now, whereas, you know, I'm sure... You know, in the past, somebody probably had the thought, you know, while they had that partition going on in there, that I want to go in there. Well, if you did, what would happen to you? 
He'd be struck down, man, immediately. He would die. So interpretation of the Jews and the Gentiles at that time, because the Gentiles were filled with that. So, yeah, the, the, the outer court is where the Gentiles, if they took on and believed, uh, believed in, in Yahweh and Jehovah, then they were allowed. To, they couldn't even go into that middle part. And they definitely couldn't go into the, the very holy of holies. And, and none of Israel could go in there with the exception of the high priest, which we know started with Aaron. He was the very first high priest. But they had all these religious ceremonies, all these things that they had to do for an outward cleansing before they could even go in there. But the walls, they were put up in a separation. And that's what this is talking about here, that in Christ, there's not even any more a, a Jew or Gentile. That's what he's telling us here. It's like, quit thinking of yourself as more holy and, and you got some advantage on somebody or whatever. You don't. And that's what Israel was doing is, you know, God told them to just be a light on a hill. And but they weren't. They weren't doing that, you know. But that's that's the picture we got because there was a separation. Gentiles were known to the to the Jews as what? Samaritans. Samaritans, there's another name I'm looking for. It starts with a D. They were considered dogs. They were unclean. That's a that's a good one. And in Christ, he's saying, no. Because of my sacrifice, that was sufficient. Now, all of you that choose to believe on me, or believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are one new man, all one together. When Christ died on the cross, the word says that the veil was rent in twain. That is meaning it was ripped in half from the top to the bottom. Yeah, if it had been ripped from the bottom up, you know. Yeah, well. It was like four inches thick. Yeah. You know, the veil, every year they made a new veil. Every year they made a new veil. It says in Mark 15, 37, and Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. Top to bottom, which is a beautiful picture of Father. You know what? Because what we what, what all that was was trying to, to get to him, he's like, you know, it's done. It's ripped in half, ripped in half. So each and every one of us can now experience God for ourselves. The veil was renewed once a year. It was, it was, it was four inches thick. It was said by Josephus that the veil could not be pulled apart by even horses tied to each side. They couldn't do it. It was so woven together. It was so intricately bound together that it couldn't be torn. Only God could tear it. And he's the one that did that for me because the word says that. The veil was what it was a partition. It was a wall to separate God himself he, uh, from them. It was ripped in half from the top to the bottom, making the statement that the system was ended of a man being the high priest because Christ was the ultimate high priest. He came and fulfilled everything. He fulfilled every demand of God and God, because he was obedient, even under the death on the cross, he did every bit of that. Yes, Mitch. That's right. That's where I'm getting. Right now, each and every one of us, you know, there's not a, it's not set up over there. Now they talk about, you know, Israel has, they, they have everything to set the temple up right now. And I've heard that they can just set it up in a few days. They've even got the walls ready to go for it. You know, that could get us into a lot, a lot of stuff to talk about. We're not going to go there, but they even have the, the effort. They, they got, they got it all, man, yeah. but they don't have the spirit of God. I'm here to tell you that that middle wall of partition has been broken down so that you and me, it's not even a once a year thing. How would it be that, okay, y'all come to church once a year and we're going to try to enter in. Hopefully that, uh, you know, we're not going to have anything on us and get struck dead. Oops, <laughs> he died, you know, you go a little further, go, I'm dead too. Yeah. It ain't like that. You, by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, have been, you've been brought nigh to God and you can enter in any time. And I want to tell you, when you get down on your knees, 
whether you're standing, where you're driving, where you're laying in bed, wherever you're at, whatever you're doing, you can enter in into the throne of grace. And that's what he's telling us here. Anybody can. And I can't say that you can't. You know what? I'm Pastor John. And only I can enter. I'll enter in for you. How would you like that? No, sir. The word of God says that I can because Jesus Christ was obedient unto death and even the death on the cross. Because he did that, my way in now is through him, not through a man. If it were through a man, then it would be a fallible thing, would it not? Come on. We see in 70 AD, the temple being totally destroyed and bringing an end to that institution once for all. How would it have been for that temple to continue to have stood? God wasn't going to allow that. Because they even, after the death on the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ and the resurrection from the dead, they continue to set themselves up for years and years in trying to do that practice, that institution of, of being the middleman of partition. And God said, you know what? Well, he already prophesied it. In 70 AD was the day. And so he went in and destroyed it and said, it's done. God uses nations to judge nations, does he not? And that's what happened there. When Christ abolished the partition, it made the way open for the Jew and Gentile together by believing on Christ. No more separation even between the two because it is by faith that we both believe under righteousness in Christ Jesus. You know, just think about the fear even with Israel when the high priest would go in just wondering, you know, and it's been said that they tied a rope and did a bell. I don't know if they did that in case they had to pull him out. I don't know if that's factual or not. Some say it is, some say it ain't. But just the mere fact that Israel, in a moment of just silence, wondering when that high priest going, is, is he going to get rejected? Did he get everything right? Did he get the T's crossed and everything dotted? Did he wash his garments enough? Did he do this? Did he put on the right garments? Did he put them on the right order? Did he do all this stuff? Because if he goes in and he didn't do it exactly to the way it was prescribed, man, we're done. Think about the fear in that. I want you to know that Jesus Christ did it right down to the last very detail that God set up for him. He did it right. He was obedient to the death on the cross. Amen. But when he said it's finished, he wasn't talking about he had finished. No. He had finished he what would. God had sent him to do. That's exactly what he, he was talking about. He came to do the will of the Father. Yep. To show us the will of the Father. Right. So on the cross, when he says, if it's finished, says, Father, I've done everything you've asked me to do. Yep. That's right. You know, that word finished. I looked it up one day, <clears throat> and they even used that word finish. In, uh, like taxis is finished. That's good, Lori. <laughs> that's good. I, I know you and Sandy are thinking on the same way there, probably. It's finished. We can move on. We got a little bit of time. Yep, that's good. But in wine, in tasting wine, that the finish, that, that word is used in that. Think about that with the vinegar that, that Jesus took. It was a bitter cup that he drank. Shortly after that, he said those very words, it is finished, it's done. Nothing more to do. Yes, he died, but we were told in prophecy that he'd be resurrected from the dead, and he was, amen? If he had never resurrected from the dead, then we, this would just be preaching in vain. It wouldn't mean nothing. But we know that we know that we know, number one, by the word of God, that he rose. But there's also, also been testimony upon testimony, even in history books, Things dating back from Josephus and things of that nature that said that this is what happened. And I'm going to tell you, you got a, a witness on the inside of you, folks. How I many of you got a witness on the inside of you? That you know that you know that you know. Amen. Praise God. Does it actually have to be in fear of not repenting if someone is saying, Yeah, I said yeah. It's all covered yourself to believe that and repent yeah. and walk in it. But when God shows you there's something, you repent. Yes. Yeah. Because that would be miserable. Oh my goodness. Yeah, yeah we. I, I know. 
I know we've ministered to so many people over the years and it was, Oh, I just gotta know. I just I gotta know if there's something, there's gotta be something there. And it's like, yeah. What are you doing? You've gotten a place of fear. You've gotten a place of striving. And I would tell you, just trust God that he's going to show you in his time. A lot of people struggle with stuff. They're like, man, I just, and he gets you in a place of drivenness, performance. And what does that do? Drivenness and performance. It just brings more garbage in is what it does. The Lord says we're supposed to be resting. So anything that steals your rest, I'd say it's not of the Lord. Rest in him. Trust in him. Unbelief is what comes in and it steals that rest. And it gets us into the place of performance. And then that, what that does is it's removing what Christ did at the cross. And now you're trying to accomplish something on your own. That's works. And works, we've talked about it. I preach it here. Works is filthy rags, folks. Believing what Christ did at the cross is all sufficient. But when Christ shows you, when Father shows you something, if there's something there that is not repented of, man, just repent of it. Man, it doesn't have to, you don't have to call me and say, Pastor, I need a, I need a specific prayer to, to, to make sure that I got this one covered. I just laugh at that. You know, a simple prayer, Father. I acknowledge that. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Gone. Gone. Past. How many of you go into the bathroom, man? When you get through, just let it sit there. All right, pastors, you're a little gross here. How many of you go outside and get a stick and go back in? Come on, man. Do you flush it or not? Get it out. Deal with it. Do what God, God's made provision for it. You appropriate the provision and be done with it. Move on. Amen. 15, it says, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make into himself of twain one new man, glory to God. So making what? Peace. Nothing lacking, nothing missing. That's what peace is. There's nothing wanting. Everything's there. This verse is clear that there was enmity between Jew and Gentile because there was an institution in place to keep the Jews a distinct people and pointing out, get a hold of this, to make them a distinct people and pointing out the Son of God until he should come. That was the purpose of it. The Jews looked at Gentiles as dogs, totally dogs. And the Gentiles held the Jews in the most sovereign contempt even because of their religious rights and their ceremonies being different from all the other nations of the earth. Think about that. Gentiles looking in on them, and you guys are nuts. You got to do this and this and that, you know? Man, all we got to do is pick any tree out and just go and offer a sacrifice. They couldn't pick any tree out. It had to be exactly where God says you can put an altar there. Why? Because it was by the Lord. And it would only be accepted with what God said. All the other religions of the world and stuff, there is man involved in all those things. There is man giving of themselves to procure some sort of distorted righteousness, and there's none. There is no righteousness in that. It's a thing of works. It's always. You know, you can tell a person that, like, well, what's the difference about Christianity? My Lord died for me. My king gave up his life for me me in Islam did he give it up for them no he required them to give up something and even today we see that just with bombers and all this stuff they do and man they got a I mean, it's sad but you know they think that they go in and they blow up some building and take out as many people I mean, heathens to them that they can, that they're just, they're getting a much better reward, and they're going to have, what is it, 70 virgins? Well, I, one's, one woman's good enough for me, praise God. <laughs> well, do they have a surprise, though, do they? They listen to the lie, and the lie is deception, 
They're waking up in hell. I'm going to tell you right now, we're a church that preaches about hell too, folks. There's a literal hell, and I believe that hell is going to be there for eternity. Some people say that it's it's only there for a short amount of time. No, it's there because the word of God says it's there and it will continue on everlasting. It's a literal place. So it's clear the enmity between Jew and Gentile because that institution has been broken down now. And it's up to us to say, you know what? You and me, we're, we're, we're one in Christ. I ain't got nothing over you guys. And don't you ever, ever look at me as I'm something better or great. I am not. And I, 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 would, I would propose to you that what Paul says, man, I am the worst of sinners. I have not arrived, but one day I will, glory to God. I'm just pressing on to the high calling, to the mark of the Lord Jesus Christ that he has set, and that's what I keep pressing on to. I ain't perfect. I've been telling y'all that for a while. Some of y'all have experienced that I ain't perfect. <laughs> but glory to God, we're in this thing together, aren't we? Amen. That's the great thing about not being perfect, but Jesus being perfect, that you can come in and say, I'm sorry, and you can move on. It's a choice, amen? Christ, by his death, abolished the enmity between the Jew and the Gentile, and also all the commandments contained in those ordinances. And in so doing, he made in himself two peoples, one. Two people, one, one. The word says in Galatians 3, 25 through 29. Galatians 3, 25 through 29. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. All the way back to Abraham. All the way back to Abraham. Yes, ma'am. Huh? 35 minutes. Praise the Lord. Hey, I just got permission to preach on. <laughs> Are you guys good preaching on? I, I would love to get Ephesians chapter 2 done because over the next 9 to 10 weeks, we're going to be doing the boundaries class. And then we'll get into chapter 3, which is, oh, man, I'm, I'm, I'm loving this study. How about you guys? Are you all enjoying this? Is it giving you some, some stuff to really chew on? Praise God. Once we got time, can we talk about something? Yeah, go for it. Uh, in your verses, please read the verse 15 of that. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. The ordinances are the tradition of that. Right. The penitent. Torah. Yeah. All right, what we call law. Uh, it, it can be translated law, but it's just better translated teaching. Christ is our righteousness. He died for our righteousness. He is fulfillment of the commandments. Right. Not the tradition, not the ordinances, not the tradition of it, but the commandments, yeah. which means the Pentateuch is righteousness with deliverance. Right. Now, we under the law as far as tradition, I mean, not, not tradition, but we're under the law as far as um, Could we fulfill that? No, not no. for us. Okay. Never in a million years. So we, we have an advocate now. It's Christ so, Jesus. So that was walk through. Yeah. So think about this. Let, let, let me put it in this way. Does God tell us to love? Yeah. When we don't love, 
what happens. Now, some of us understand a deeper level of not loving, but if you've sat here long enough in our church, you can you understand that not loving produces illness. What is illness? It's a curse. Is, it, is an illness a blessing? Is cancer a blessing? No. Is fibromyalgia a blessing? No. Is diabetes a blessing? No. Is fill in the blank. Let's throw some of them out there. Some diseases that are out there. Maybe some you've experienced yourself. Asthma. Is that a blessing? I had a friend in school that had asthma problems. Well, that's an effect of a family, unfortunately, not being instructed in righteousness and allowing certain things, certain thought patterns to be brought in and living and doing those things. And therefore, that's a penalty. But what the Lord says is that, yes, Christ is our righteousness. He's removed all those penalties. But if you choose to not love, if you choose to hate, let's take self-hatred for one thing. If you choose to not let yourself off the hook because what was sufficiently done at the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, you can be guaranteed there is an effect that is on its way. But as soon as you repent and say, Father God, forgive me, I ask for forgiveness, that thing is stayed. Remember that's Israel? Why, that's why we don't carry shame. We should, not carry shame. we should not carry shame. Shame is of the devil. That's exactly right. Guilt, feeling guilty, that is appropriate. But shame is not of the Lord. He took that to the cross for you also. But guilt comes in because you've done something you shouldn't have done. In Christ, are we allowed to just go and do whatever we want? Can you go and do whatever you want? Yes. Sure you could. Yeah. And sometimes some in the Lord do that. Well, do you think that whatsoever man soweth that shall he also reap? Do you think that there's a punishment coming? With the Lord Jesus Christ for the body of Christ, what happens is chastisement. We've talked about chastisement. To be chasing the Lord is to be his. Praise God for chastisement. The Lord comes in and he woos you and he speaks to your heart and says, repent, turn, turn, turn. There's conviction there. Turn, quit doing that. Quit gossiping. Quit doing this. Quit going there. Quit doing that. But if you won't, then there is a penalty for that. And that's what Mitch is talking about. But I'm here to tell you that we're not under that curse of the law. It's very clear. It's been removed. But if you choose to put yourself underneath that thing again, then you can be guaranteed there's a penalty coming. But that can be stayed. We see with Israel, many times they did things. Boy, well, they really tested God in the wilderness. And he would come in and people would just start dropping like flies. And Moses would run and he would plead and he would beg and he would try to stand between God and the people. I'm going to tell you right now that Christ is standing between you and God. People say that God is love. Yes, he is. But he is a just God and he has to judge sin. He can't let sin off the hook. If he were to do that, everything would just collapse and he would not be a just God. But I'm telling you that he is. And we as his children, if we choose to sin willfully, what the word of God says is there's not a sacrifice for that anymore. You are incurring a penalty that's coming, but I'm here to tell you also that 1 John 1, 9 says that you can have it stayed. You can have the judgment. Yes, you may have something you're going to reap on this earth because of your consequences of making choices. But the curse of the law, it is not for his believers. But if you make the choice, to gossip, to be backbiting, to hate yourself. If you decide to hate yourself, your body will respond in accordance to that. And that is a curse. We're, we're commanded to love. And I'm going to tell you right now, I can't love you. I can't even love my wife or love my children. I can't even love myself unless I understand the love of my Father, which is in heaven for me. Once I get it, then I get it. And it's from that foundation that I move forward. And I know that my father is a loving father. He wants me to repent. We're a church that preaches repentance. That's one of the things we preach here. Repentance so you can remove that penalty that's coming. I've had my children do things in the past. and 
I mean, I remember as a child doing things in the past that I knew wasn't right. And then I turned, I said, man, I'm sorry. And before it was found out and I came and said, man, I'm sorry. I did such and such because of the guilt and stuff. And as a child, shame was there, of course. Didn't understand that. That wasn't mine. And with mama and daddy, and even with us, with our children, you know, there's mercy. Man, there's mercy. There's mercy with our father in heaven. You know, we would come in and we would expect as being a prodigal that, <laughs> you know, the father didn't with the prodigal say, okay, you know what, you just go out there and you meet behind the woodshed and I'm going to take care of your little rear end and beat the tar out of it. Unfortunately, we've, we've all experienced that as, as children growing up. How many of you got beat <laughs> by mom and dad or somebody that was taking care of you when you were a child in excess? Come on. What that has done is that has skewed your view of your father, which is in heaven. There's mercy with Father God. There's mercy with him. How much longer do I have? About 10 minutes, according to what she was saying when she came in. Josh, run in there and ask her how much longer we got. Come back in here and tell me. Okay. We're all this. Christ by his death abolished the enmity. This is the one new man in Christ. One new man in Christ. And it is by faith completely, totally by faith. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Hang on. Four, six hours. What? Four, six hours. Four, six hours. Okay. We go that long later. <laughs> Let's go ahead and start the boundaries class. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. It is by faith completely, and that faith is Abraham's seed, which was even before the law. We talked about that too. It is by faith. Abraham gave before the law. And that I would propose to you that it's always been about faith. Always. That. And in Revelation, it says, I saw a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. God's on the outside of time. I don't get that. I know that time was set up for us. I mean, I, do, I can see it as a circle. Here's time. It's going. It's doing. You know, we had the sun come up, the moon, blah, blah, blah. God's on the outside of that. And it's all contained and held together by him. So he, on the outside of time, he saw a lame slain before the foundation of the world. Even before Adam sinned, Jesus Christ was slain in God's eyes. That's beautiful. Already made provision. Nothing taken God by surprise. Nothing can. Nothing will. Amen. Ephesians 2.16. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. That is to reconcile to God at the same time both Jew and Gentile, and therefore by his body given as a sacrifice. That's that limb. I'm going to cut it off later. It's hitting the deal out there. I was in here praying last night for the service today, and the limb was starting to blow last night. Later. Bang! I'm like, what in the world? <laughs> Somebody trying to get in? <laughs> it was awful. Huh? It was awful. It was, it was a lot of wind. So I went out there and I stood. And I was like, all right, I'm going to watch this. It says, one of the limbs, it's like that. Oh, okay. So we're going to get it cut off. It says to reconcile both unto God and one body by the cross. Therefore, we are now one new man if we are in Christ Jesus. How many of you are in Christ Jesus this morning? How many of you believe that Jesus Christ made a way to your Father which is in heaven? Amen. Both Jew and Gentile are led by God's spirit and acting upon these things of the gospel. In other words, laying aside all contention, every bit of it. Ephesians 2.17. And came and preached peace to you which were far off and to them that were nigh. Preached the readiness of God to forgive both to Jew and Gentile alike. That is what peace is. Having peace with God and also peace with other other people. You can't have peace with others unless you got peace with God first, because you're going to walk by the flesh. But in Him, we walk by the Spirit. We have peace with Him, peace with ourselves. We can have peace with others. It is only in Christ we see today nations continue to rise up against each other. 
rush over there wanting Ukraine, wanting the, what do they call it, the basket, uh, the bread basket of the world or whatever, very fertile land. They want that place. I don't understand all the politics. There's a lot of politics garbage. I, I care less about that stuff. But it's because of envy and jealousy that peace cannot reign. Man's hearts are distorted. It is only by Christ reigning in our hearts can we have even peace with our neighbors and understand what's going on in that spiritual kingdom that's working there. In 18, it says, for through him, we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Praise God. Both, all of us, we all have access. It says in 2.18, I have access now to Father God because of what Jesus Christ did. I don't need a man to give me access. No, sir. To have a man as access and to believe that is to set aside the provision that's been done at the cross is what it does. This verse takes us all the way back to verse 14, which talks about the petition that separated us and that it is in Christ now that we go to the Father. What a beautiful verse that shows us the Godhead and that there is the Father, there is the Son, and there is the Holy Ghost. Glory to God. All in that one verse. Isn't that beautiful? Man, that's, that's incredible. You have, you have religions out there that deny the Godhead even. Father, Son, and Spirit. There are those that only believe in oneness and stuff. That is contrary to the Word of God. Yes, are they one? Yes, they are. But there is the Godhead. It's very clear, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. There's those that believe in, I don't even know what you call it, to this. We call it, the, uh, I've heard it said, the Benity, instead of the Trinity, the Benity. They only believe in two. Through Jesus, we now have access to the Father to come boldly into his presence. It says in Hebrews 4, 14 through 16, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. I would encourage you this morning, hold fast your profession. Do not let it go. What is your profession? My profession is Jesus. Jesus, 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 only Jesus. There is no other way. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He knows. He knows the sufferings you've gone through and are going through. But it says, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Temptation's not a sin, folks. A lot of people say, well, I'm being tempted. I might as well do it. No. Jesus Christ was tempted, but yet without sin. Because when he was tempted, he did not do it. Just don't do it. I can tell you, do it. Just do it. I tell you, don't do it. <laughs> Just do it when it comes to being obedient to the Lord, though. Amen. But when it comes to the enemy, don't do it. Just don't do it. Glory to God. He says, yes, without sin, let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Our high priest is Jesus. It's not a man other than the man, Jesus Christ. He understands our temptations, and he is the mediator between us and God the Father. Would you deny with Scripture? Do you believe the Word? Do you believe the Holy Word of God? Do you think there's anything else? Come on. This is the Holy Word of God that was given to us by Father. And I would say that this has existed even before the foundation of the world. It's existed forever. Because God has been forever. And don't even try to figure that one out. My word. Ephesians 2 19. How many more do I got? Man, I'm almost done. Let's get done with this and then we're gonna we're gonna do a song and then we'll, we'll pray and bless the food. It says in 19, now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. If you have to have somebody else go in and represent you before your father, which is in heaven, then there's a separation there. You are a foreigner. There's something going on that you don't have access. You need somebody else. And I'm going to tell you, Jesus Christ is our access. He's made us able to come into the presence of God. Not a man other than the man Christ Jesus. Amen. Gentiles, when they would come to Jerusalem as strangers, man, they had no rights. They had no privileges. 
They had, they didn't even have charters or grants in that respect. They were considered heathens and could not even settle among the Jews. If the Gentiles did acknowledge the God of Israel, but did not get circumcised, then they could dwell in the land as what they called sojourners. You've heard that term before. They would possibly be able to rent, but they could not own any land and they had no rights. You have rights. Look at your neighbor and say, man, I got rights. Got rights. You got rights. Jesus. What verse 19, I believe, is saying here is that as Gentiles, upon our belief in Christ, we are no longer sojourners in the land. and Therefore, we have all the rights as a believer. That belongs to us. That is our right because of what Christ went and did at the cross. We are actually fellow citizens with all the saints. And it is by faith in Christ that we are the, of the household of God. And if we are his household, then we have the right to receive all the household blessings, grace, and glory. And we have access to Father God. Nothing lacking, nothing missing. You have everything. It's up to you to appropriate it and to trust and believe and believe the word is true. Ephesians 2.20, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the corner, the chief corner stone. We've talked about that before, that when they would get to a cornerstone and laying a foundation, when two walls were to meet at a corner, there was used a very large cornerstone to bring the two walls together. Think about that. That's what they would do. They would lay a, a cornerstone right there to bring this wall. So that wall is Jews. And that wall is Gentiles. Jesus. One and the same. A wall, when it's joined together, it becomes one with that. It's, it's togetherness in that. It's both Jew and Gentile today, one in himself. Both are connected together into one building by that stone. Would you stand with me this morning? Ephesians 2.21. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. Joe, you've been framing a house for some dear, precious folks and joining it all together. Eventually that'll be done. I've seen some pictures. How many of y'all ever built a house before? Man, it's a job. I'm going to tell you this house, the Lord Jesus Christ has built it. No other man was qualified. No other man was capable to do it other than Jesus. Both those from Judaism and heathenism are together as one into the one building that is not finished growing or being built, but it continues to this day. It's being built today, but it has not ended in building. He's continuing to build it. And it can only be built by the foundation, that cornerstone of the Lord Jesus Christ. It will continue to increase every day. Every day. And in the last verse of this chapter says, in whom we also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. I believe all of chapter 2 has been a metaphor of a building and the habitation of God within it being the temple, the earthly temple of God had chose to dwell therein, but another, uh, another death of Christ, this death of Christ, his presence departed there. His, his presence ain't there anymore, folks. Man, and, and, and Israel is wanting to rebuild that. I mean, they got it all. They, they, they got the candlesticks. They got everything that they need to get that dude built again. That's not it. He has chosen to take up habitation, and that is with mankind. That's in your heart when you choose to believe. So the metaphor is the temple in Jerusalem, the temple now being us and his spirit living within us. Amen. Is there anybody here this morning that does not know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior? And the Lord has spoken to your heart, or maybe somebody that will See this later on YouTube. We record these messages. This is our last Zoom that we're doing for a while, like we said. But this will be on YouTube. 
And I would speak to those that are on YouTube in a future date. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, all you have to do is simply believe that that wall has come down and there's a wall that will never be resurrected again. Jesus Christ has made the gap. All you have to do is believe. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Does anybody need prayer for anything this morning? Anybody need prayer for anything at all? If not, we're going to bless the tithes and offerings. This is your opportunity to come and put your tithes and offerings in the box. We're going to pray over and bless them and ask the Lord to prosper that. So we're man, so if that shall be also work. That's what the word of God says. Amen. Don't sow to the flesh, but sow unto the spirit. Let the Lord do what he wants to do. Amen. Yes, Mitch. Do you know Patty? That's the one that. Patty has. Your great niece. Okay. What does pneumonia come out of? Y'all know what the spiritual, yeah, the spiritual condition for pneumonia is fear. That's why we see so many times people going into the hospital, they end up getting pneumonia because when you go into the hospital, no, that's not where you want to be. I've gone in and ministered to many people in the past that had pneumonia and they were on a bad place and led them through repentance and fearing and not trusting God. And the Lord healed them immediately. They were released either that day or the next day. It's fear. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just intercede right now on Hattie's uh, behalf, Father God, as the church of Jesus Christ. We intercede and we come against every fear that is speaking to that little girl in Jesus' name. And we rebuke it by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in Jesus' name. I think it's a close Yeah, it's probably mom and dad too. So, Father, they probably don't know. So we intercede on their behalf also. Help them, Lord for their inner man, their spirit to trust you, Father God, to just put trust in you that, that you're going to take care of that. And we rebuke all fear in Jesus' name. And we tell you, take your hands off right now in Jesus' name. And we thank you, Father, for your presence coming in and ministering to her. In the mighty name of Jesus, thank you, Lord. Anybody else? Anyone else? Chris is, is, is doing good. I expected him to be here this morning, but um, he's moving. Okay, he got a new house. Praise God. Yep. Yeah. We're not on. We're not being recorded anymore. Are we? we still are. All right. Go ahead and end it. Bless you. Love you guys.